The premise of ZFS is to create a reliable storage system out of inherently unreliable components. Use commodity, hardware, processors, memory, disks, but create a system where you can depend on the data integrity. It's historically thought too expensive to checksum all your data with sound checksums. Too expensive in CPU, too expensive in the space to actually store the checksum. It turns out that isn't actually true anymore. And there is real world evidence to show that silent data corruption, which if you think about it, is actually the worst kind. When you don't know your data is being corrupted, that's when you're really screwed. If you know your data is being corrupted, you can maybe restore from backup. It is a reality. And anything else isn't acceptable because otherwise it's not your data anymore. And it may be meaningless or downright harmful to you, particularly if it's financial data. So, how do we get data integrity in ZFS? It's an always consistent on disk. Everything is copy on write, so we never overwrite any live data. The on disk state is always valid. And we get snapshots for free. It's a transactional based system, and it doesn't use journaling for integrity. It uses something called an intent log to provide POSIX synchronous semantics for POSIX. Uh, tran uh, transactional consistency, and it has end-to-end -end checksums. The entire ZFS uh, layer of data is what's called the Merkle tree, and if we validate the top-level block, we know that everything below it has validated. Um, we can use that checksum at the individual block level to recreate the correct version of data when we discover one side of a mirror or a RAID has uh, gone wrong. And it protects us across the interconnect of the storage system, whether that be local SaaS, local IDE, iSCSI, fiber channel over Ethernet. And it helps even in some cases bugs in the device drivers and in other places as well. So in ZFS, we use, the term scrub is used to walk the, the entire pool and deliberately read every single block that's still valid for a data set and check it on all sides of the mirror or all versions in the red Z. Um, it's not automatic because in that it's not a back, general background task. It's because it's expensive in I.O. and it may hurt your real performance. Um, so that's why it's something you have to opt into to do it at the time that's right for you. If we do a read and it turns out we get a checksum failure, we do exactly we run exactly the same piece of code as if we had run a, if we had done a scrub. So we will do the repair synchronously. Is it fair, is it fair to say that this, this design assumes that the hardware will always report errors? No. Because it assumes the hardware does not deliberately lie to you. Like it says, I put the block on disk. Um, it doesn't assume that it put the block in the right place. It doesn't assume that you get the same block black when you read. But it assumes that when you, you tell the disk, put this on disk, and it says, yes, I did it, it puts something on disk. It assumes they don't downright lie to you. And the reason I emphasize that is because there are disks that just lie. Because they're buggy, or the interconnect between the disk and the thing is buggy in such a bad way. And unfortunately, it's really common in USB drives, particularly cheap ones. Or just drive in Yeah. So the whole of ZFS is designed to be administered with two commands. The zpool command to, rate, to lay out the storage pool. And this is where you choose your do I want to do mirroring? Do I want to do the equivalent of RAID 5, RAID 6? Um, and then within that storage pool, you create file systems. We call them data sets in ZFS because they can either be a POSIX file system or they can be what we call a ZVOL, which is a block and character device that looks like a disk, but it's just a chunk of your storage. Why would you want to do that? Well, to run some other file system on top of it, to share it out over iSCSI, fiber channel over Ethernet, to run a database on it that likes to run on raw storage because it thinks it knows best, and some of them do. Um, so unlike in a traditional model of file systems, you don't create a chunk of storage of a fixed size 
and put a file system on it, and that file system is fixed. ZFS file systems, in the default case, can take up from no bytes other than their own metadata up to the full size of the pool. You can constrain these using reservations and quotas. But by and large, just let them float around and take up the space they actually need. File systems, or data sets in general, are policy control points. They look like directories of all you're dealing with as file systems. But this is the point where you choose what checksum algorithm you want, what compression you want. Do you want DDoT turned on? Do you want encryption turned on? So I want to change the elevator pitch and answer one word, secured. And I'm going to show you why. All right, so without encryption turned on, I'm going to show you how easy it is to recover the plain text of your data. Now, for the purposes of demo um, and testing, ZFS can actually run backed by a file in another file system, even if that's other ZFS. Um, so it's really handy for testing. So I've got two files here called D1 and D2 that are about 128 meg. So I'm going to create a pool. So I created my storage pool. Since this is for demo purposes, I'm not going to bother about whether or not we have any redundancy or not. I don't know why my machine's running a bit slow. Um, and what I want to show is that the machine actually comes back to me. It shouldn't take that long. Um, how easy it is to recover plain text. Uh, my machine's been playing funny since it was on the airplane yesterday and it's been swapping really badly, which is what it's doing right now. Let me try that again. Okay. Maybe I just didn't press return properly. Okay, so I've got a pool called clear here now, and I'm going to take a copy of the text of Hamlet. Uh, from the Gutenberg project, uh, just to show you what it looks like. Um, after all, the license and stuff, it's just as Shakespeare originally wrote it. Okay, so let's copy that into the fo first file system that we got on this pool called Clear. Now, the nice advantage about um, using file rather than a whole disk is that I can make it nice and small, and I'm not dealing with the 200 gigabyte disk that I'm going to run strings over. So if I run strings over this and pipe it into less, a bunch of text in here that's ZFS metadata, we start paging down a bit, and look at that. All nicely formatted even, and this is running strings over my raw disk. This is how easy it is to recover your data. That's why you need encryption. Now, had I turned compression on, it wouldn't be that easy, but there are a bunch of modifications that haven't yet integrated into Solaris um, that you can run with MDB over the disk and you'll get exactly the same effect. Right. I've also done that demo on a slightly more powerful machine where it was Windows Notepad that I created the text file in, running on XP, writing to an NTFS file system over iSCSI, and I run strings on the Solaris site, and I get exactly the same style of nicely formatted output. So it doesn't actually matter what your file system is. If it's not doing encryption, it's that easy. So let's make a secured, reliable storage system from inherently unreliable components. And this is what we're going to do. So some of the key requirements for adding encryption into ZFS. Um, ZFS was always designed with the intent that encryption would be there. It was just how to actually do it and getting around to do it, because it, it's an evolving system. We cannot break, copy, and write semantics. That means that a lot of the methods that are traditionally used for doing file system encryption or volume encryption just don't apply here. We have to exist, integrate it into the existing administrative model. And ideally, we want to support existing pools, because in many configurations, you don't have to encrypt all of your data, just that which is sensitive to you. We also want to be able to support systems that may only have a single disk, laptops, 
So you might not need to be able to encrypt the operating system and every copy of the operating system you have on there, but you sure want to encrypt your data. You maybe don't care about whether you encrypt your MP3 files or not. So it allows the support existing pools is, is also a requirement about allowing choice of whether or not things are encrypted within a given storage pool. So you can make the trade-off of what you expend your resources encrypting. We want to be able to support the NIST guidelines on key management, both for wrapping keys and data encryption keys. And this has got to fit into all the environments that Solaris can be deployed in. So it's got to work on everything from a single user desktop environment, an NFS server, a storage server, and it's got to work in the multi-level and zones for containment cases as well. And ideally, we want to be able to allow delegation of how you do the key management and the encryption policy as far as we can. We've got to support a pure software solution. We can't assume you've got hardware crypto. Um, the only difference between hardware crypto and not should be performance and security of the, the wrapping keys. But functionally, they should be the same. And we want to be able to support both the key management that we provide plus the ability to hook into other remote key management systems from third parties as well. So ZFS already gave us the ability to set compression, set checksum at the level of a, a data set file system. If you want to think about it in a more naive terms, think about it at the level of a directory. Why not the level of a file? Some people have proposed file system encryption that does file level encryption. Well, because of the way that POSIX file systems work, and to a certain extent, even applications on you know, Windows tend to work, is they open up the file, you make a bunch of modifications to it, and they don't actually overwrite the blocks in place. They write to a temporary file. When they're happy that that file was on disk because the OS told them, they delete the old one and they did a rename under the front, underneath. So it's not really file encryption. File encryption just doesn't work because it's not the same file. It may have the same name to the human, but it really wasn't the same file. So there are a lot of tricky things you have to deal with if, if that's the level you go at. By and large, a lot of those systems tend to do that temporary file dance in the same directory. So directory level encryption is good. Um, it's easier for people to understand. And because ZFS data sets are so cheap, they're effectively like directories that you just want to start enforcing a new policy on. That's why we chose the data set level. Another choice would have been we did it down at the level of the pool. But that wouldn't have allowed us to add encryption to an existing pool, because it would have to be something you made a choice at when you set the pool up. And it would also make dealing with uh, systems that need to have a mix of encrypted and non-encrypted data uh, difficult. Also make the choice between one crypto algorithm and another on a paired data set difficult as well. And all of those things were in the requirements that we gathered from people that we spoke to. So, while it only uses the three key strengths of AES initially, it's designed to be extensible. It's not pluggable because the crypto involved in this is too hard to make it an end administrator pluggable um, because there are very specific properties we need for the encryption algorithms and the modes. Um, it's extensible in a, if, you, if your algorithm has the right mode, say you wanted to run Camellia in CCM mode, um, that would be probably a one line change to, to ZFS to be able to add that in. If you want to run some other algorithm that doesn't quite work like AES and doesn't have a CCM mode, that's going to be much more work. And a lot of discussion with cryptographers as well. Um, so like every other property in ZFS, things are inherited if you create a new sub data set. So we start off at the top level, we create a data set, we create another one below that, we inherit all the properties. So once you start doing encryption, we don't allow you to turn it back off again. So if you turn encryption on at you know, the home directory point in your, your pool, then everybody's home directory created below that is encrypted as well. We do allow you to switch which encryption algorithm you use, but once you're encrypting, you're always encrypting. Um, and that's mostly to make sure that you don't make some mistakes. If you really want to abuse this and create funny mount hierarchies with subdirectories that are not mounted and stuff, you can get yourself tied up in all sorts of knots using existing sim links or LOFS or doing all sorts of funny stuff with the mount point hierarchy in ZFS. So it's a protection against initial silly stuff we're trying to protect, uh, do here. So why, so we said we allow you to set the encryption policy when you create a data set. 
but you can change the compression algorithm, the checksum algorithm for any ZFS data set at any time, and it affects all newly written blocks. We don't allow that for encryption. Only at the point when you create a data set can you turn on encryption. Why? Well, how otherwise would we know that we were safe? We would have to go and visit every block, read it, encrypt it. Oh, but hang on, ZFS is copy on write. So we don't actually overwrite the old block. So we now need another process to go in scrub, but not in the term that ZFS use, bleach whatever you're, um, get rid of the old plain text. And how long is that going to take? Minutes, hours, days? Well, it depends how much data you've got. It could be never if you've got a really large volume of data because you may not have the I.O. bandwidth to actually be able to do this. So you don't know when you're actually going to become safe. We can make some guesses. We can make some estimates. Um, but that would mean we'd need a way to tell you. And then you'd have to be happy with how we erased the old content from disk as well. So to make it easier, you create the data set encrypted, and then it's always encrypted. The other thing is then you don't have to get into discussions about, well, I created it with AES 128 to start with, but now it's AES 256. Some blocks are encrypted 128, some blocks are 256. What do you tell the user? Is it AES 128? Is it 256? And depending on current literature, one of the other may be stronger. So encryption policy is fixed. You can change the wrapping keys, because those are just a key that's managed by the user. But every time we create a file system, we randomly generate, in a secure way, the actual data encryption keys. And the user does not deal with those data encryption keys. They only deal with the wrapping key. If your data is important enough to you that you want to encrypt it, we assume it's important enough to you that you really want to keep it. So we force SHA-256 on, on it as well um, as the checksum. You're not allowed to use Fletcher as the checksum algorithm. Um, and we also store um, an authentication tag out of the AES mode in the block pointer as well. So what about key management? What, what's the impact to the user? Because surely it's not just as turn encryption on and forget about it. The user's got to remember something else. So how do we give the user the ability to manage these keys? Well, it's either a passphrase that they can type in at the point the file system is mounted, um, or they can just store the raw key either in hex form or in the raw stream in a file on some other disk, hopefully something removable. Um, and eventually, we'll allow you to support to store it in anything that's accessible via the PKS11 API, so in the TPM, in a smart card, whatever else like that. This is the wrapping key we're dealing with. And to keep it nice and simple and fit with the ZFS admin model, if I create a nice big deep hierarchy of ZFS file systems, so I create a home directory file system and then I create one for Bob, Alice, whatever, and we set the key management at the level for the individual user. Bob logs in, but say Bob's got 10 other file systems below that because he, you know, he knows he doesn't, there's no point in turning compression on for his MP3 files, but maybe his source code there is, or you know, his certain types of documents are worth it, and he, you know, he likes to segregate stuff. But he really doesn't want to type in 10, 20, 100 different uh, wrapping keys. What if he's got snapshots as well of these files, and he really doesn't want to do that, because maybe he's getting snapshots taken every 15 minutes. So by default, the wrapping key is inherited to a new child data set. And this is, keeps the admin model in the ZFS way and keeps it simple for the user. In many cases, the user will have one key that they need to deal with and pass to ZFS. Um, and under the cover, ZFS will be using many different data encryption keys. What about when you create a, a ZFS clone? So a clone in ZFS is a, we take a snapshot, and the snapshots are read-only, and a clone is a way of saying, only create new blocks on disk for the things that differ between these two file systems. So, because we need to read the old blocks from the clone as well as from the origin, they have to share their data encryption keys. But maybe the reason you're creating a clone is because the data is differently sensitive to the original staff. You're forking off a copy of that. So it might be good to separate them cryptographically as well. So the point you create a clone file system, you can tell ZFS, from this point onwards, please use a new data encryption key. Whether or not it's the same key the user manages is up to the user as well. They can choose to type in the same wrapping key. Um, this allows us to deal with um, NIST guidelines on key management um, and key usage times. Um, it allows you to have uh, comply with 
in a trusted extensions deployment, you may have used clones to clone all your original user data sets or your original labels, but NIST says that for the things that differ, they should be cryptographically separated differently because you don't use the same encryption key at different classifications of data. Um, so this would be very difficult to do in a system where you're doing drive level encryption or the encryption is a, some sort of shim between the drives and the file system. You don't have that level of flexibility. So users can change the wrapping key. In, in the simplest case, the wrapping key is a passphrase. Um, it doesn't actually re-encrypt data because just like the why don't we allow you to turn clear text into ciphertext is it could take a very long time, forever. It just changes the wrapping key that the users provide. So we re-encrypt the actual encryption keys, which is a really fast operation. Um, we also allow you to, as I mentioned just previously, you can, um, when you create a clone, you can say use a new encryption key at any point. We can do that to any data set at any time. And this allows you to comply with NIST 857 on, you know, thou shalt not use the same data encryption key for more than two years. I deliberately didn't bake any policy into ZFS for this. I want the administrator to decide this. Um, the reason being, if I bake in a policy today, NIST will change their mind next year. Um, and what's good for one is not necessarily good for everybody here. Um, you can easily comply with the current 857 guidelines by a cron job that says, you know, once a month, rekey, not a big deal. And that's you well in compliance. Do you have a question? No. By rekey here, I mean from this point onwards, use a different encryption key. Does that comply with the... Yep. Yes, because the, the length of time you use a key for creating new data is how it's written in the, the guidelines. Um, there are also guidelines in there in the 857 about how long you should read old data written with a key. Um, and the other way to deal with that is to, in ZFS, you create a new data set, send the old one into the new one, and you can cycle them through that way. Um, but that period is much longer, and that period is actually outside of the lifetime of most people's storage. So chances are we, you might have another way of dealing with that anyway. And this is completely online. You don't unmount the file systems. You don't unshare them. It all stays online you do this. Yes, yes. Um, I don't initially have a way to, to purge old ones, um, but there, my plan is that to try and find a way so that you can say, well, any data that was encrypted with a key prior to this date, make it unaccessible. The problem with that is ZFS is block biased. So you could get rid of part of a file and not a whole file. So trying to work out how to present this to the user is a little bit harder. That actually brings up the question. Uh, the, uh, for my case, where you want to, uh, in reality, delete, logically delete your data by getting the keys of the mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, well, you support it by... You can get rid of the wrapping key. You get rid of the wrapping key. So one easy way to do it is the user has to be able to prove they no longer know the wrapping key. So what do you do? You change your wrapping key to something generated from dev random that you never saw. And then the next best thing to do is not only do that, but then delete the data set itself. And then you know that not only have you changed the wrapping key to something you don't know, because of the way ZFS biases um, when it will allocate, where you, where it'll allocate a new block from, chances are you're just going to overwrite what you just wrote um, because of the way it does uh, block selection. So change your, key, change your wrapping key to something you don't know is a good way to say, I no longer know the wrapping key, I can't decrypt this. And we want to support plugging into external key management. So there is a C API to libzfs, but it's all private just now. And by private, we don't mean it's hidden. It's private in that, although it's open source, it's not committed stable API and documented. The way we recommend doing it just now is there's a scripting interface in ZFS. Um, you can prompt the users for the passwords. You can pipe them into ZFS, stuff like that. So did I hear you right that, in, that you can actually, that you can actually rekey the data by putting it into a new uh, data store? 
you can. Um, so you can, you've mixed up two things there. So yes, you can, you can from the, any point in time while the file system is online, say any new data written to it from this point in time, use a new encryption key. Right. If what you actually want to do is take all the old data, many gigabytes of it, take it from ciphertext to clear text, and then put it under new ciphertext, which by the way, many three letter agencies do not recommend you do, because you're actually putting the data at more risk. It depends on what your compromise is and why you're doing this. Um, yes, you can do that by ZFS send and receive. You will have a tiny outage, and depending on how you've shared it, when you do the, the flip from the old, to, you have to basically do ZFS send to receive into a new data set. So you need double the storage space. Right. And then you do two renames. You do a rename and a promote of the old one to the old place. So you will have a small outage if you want to do an actual decrypt and re-encrypt. Re but that is going to take you a long time and a lot of storage space. And you're putting your data at risk because you're now dragging all of that clear text that probably hadn't been touched in years um, into the memory. So it depends on why you're trying to do, do that. Um, the functionality is there, but that one I deliberately didn't make too easy because it's going to really hammer your storage. Yes. No. ZFS send and receive, which is take a file system in its block form and turn it into a stream to send somewhere else, is implemented in such a way that it has to decrypt the data because of the level in ZFS that it works at. It works at what's called the DMU layer, and everything's an object at this point. It doesn't work in blocks. Um, so today, the only way to do that is you decrypt the data, decompress it, you pass it into the ARC cache, which is the in-memory cache, and then ZFS send reads it from there. ZFS send will then send it across in the clear, hopefully over a secure transport. And that's why you can do the, use this to re-encrypt. In the future, we may provide an interface where you can send compressed ciphertext. Um, we've got some use cases for it. Um, it's whether or not it all fits out and, wor and works nicely. There are some hard crypto problems with it, but there are some hard general ZFS problems with doing that anyway. Um, 